Welcome everyone. This is Megan Mitchell with Agents of Change Social Work Test Prep and I'm here to bring you another Social Work Shorts and today we're going to talk quickly about group work. So oftentimes social workers are facilitators of group work in a variety of different settings. So we're going to touch on some of the stages of group formation, just some basics to note when working with groups and we will wrap up with a practice question at the end. So groups are obviously different than when working individually with clients because you're bringing together more than one person. Groups can be challenging because we are bringing together more than one person. So there might be a variety of different opinions. Um, some people might not feel comfortable sharing in the group setting. So what's important to know first is that there's five stages of group development and this was adapted by Tuckman. I really like to use this visual so you can kind of see the different stages and then also as group members work through these stages, how they are moving from independence to interdependence or dependence and then returning back to independence because when you're working in a group, you're usually not working in isolation. So pre-group is before the group even forms, right? Members are not working at all dependently because they are not even in the group yet. So pre-group is 100% independence because there's no group to be formed. The first official stage is forming. And in this group, in this stage, the group is coming together. So the group is starting to come together. They're starting to understand what the purpose is. Group members are meeting one another. They are in those beginning stages of working together. There's still probably a lot of independence at this point, as you can see. And that's because um, the group has not had cohesion yet. So when you're forming, a lot of people are feeling one another out, um, coming up with like group expectations, purpose of the group. Um, in the forming stage, people are all oftentimes very non-confrontational because it's your first you know, couple experiences meeting one another. So people might not feel comfortable yet sharing their opinions um, or outwardly expressing their thoughts. The next stage is storming. And in storming, this is when there is kind of, as it sounds like, some conflict. Conflict is a normal, healthy part of group. So conflict is nothing to shy away from. In the storming phase, um, group members might have some disagreements. And why that is, it's because they're becoming more dependent. They're becoming more comfortable with one another. So people might feel that they are now able to express their opinion. And there might be some conflict. Also know that in storming, some people um, might really take a very forward approach and take that leadership role. And some people might not feel comfortable calling these behaviors out yet. So sometimes in storming, one person kind of takes on the leadership role. This might be seen as a positive or a negative thing. Or people just have different ideas of how they want the group to move forward. So there might be difference of opinion. There might be some really strong opinions um, or some people that don't feel comfortable sharing their opinion just yet. So storming is a total normal, normal part of group work. Um, we, like I said, nothing to shy away from when you bring people together. Not everyone's going to agree all the time. So we have forming, storming. After the storming phase, we have norming. And norming is where you're going to see the most dependence and interdependence. And norming is... You know, the group has come together, people are feeling more comfortable, those conflicts or those styles of disagreement have kind of been um, fleshed out. And norming means we know what the group norms are and we know how we're going to proceed. So um, maybe those things that were bothering group members are out on the table, group expectations are set, ground rules are set. So in norming, the group is really coming together. It's a cohesive unit. The next step is performing, and that's exactly what it sounds like. Whatever the purpose of the group is to be, the group is kind of hitting their stride. So if it was a task group and you're working, say it's a group project, and you need to produce a presentation at the end of your time together, performing is when you're putting together and you're presenting this presentation, right? Whatever it is you were set to do, 
you're doing at this stage. So it's kind of like doing the work that you were set out to do in the performing stage. And then similar to with individual clients, there's the last stage adjourning. This is similar to termination, the group ends, right? Not all groups are forever. So in the adjourning stage, the group wraps up, the group is no longer a group anymore, and the group members um, adjourn or terminate. And as you can see here, this is when there's a return to independence because the group is no longer in formation. So important to know that groups go through these different stages. So what I suggest is that you take an example um, of a time you've worked in a group and kind of walk through these different stages and you will probably find that your group um, went along this continuum as well. So we have forming, storming, norming, performing, and adjourning. So group work can be really beneficial. There's tons and tons and tons of benefits of why someone would work in a group. Um, and some members, some clients do very well in groups. Some clients do not do as well in groups. It really depends. So that is sometimes a clinical decision that we need to make if a client would be a good fit for group work. So what are some of the benefits of group work? Um, it can provide support. Um, obviously, if someone is in a group or other people are going through the same thing, that can be really positive. Um, other group members can give advice on tough issues. Um, and there's definitely that sense of community and belonging. So that's really, really positive, too. I'm part of this group. My group depends on me, and I'm accountable to the group. Um, it can help with listening skills because you might hear some things that other people are doing. You might adopt some healthy coping mechanisms or some strategies and skills. And also, you're able to gain a greater perspective if you hear other people's stories. Really important. Um, accountability is really big because sometimes people find with groups, they feel the pressure to kind of show up, right, to be accountable because the group is counting on them. So the accountability can be a really good tool to use if someone is trying to be an accountable group member. Connection, of course, um, connecting with other people, very good for people that thrive on connection. And then also you can learn a lot of skills in a group, right? Like you can learn interpersonal skills. You can work on your emotions. You can work on communication strategies. So group work has tons and tons and tons of benefits. Um, and choosing a group for your client would, all, would depend on a variety of different factors that you would need to take into consideration. So there's open groups and closed groups, and the size of the group obviously is going to vary. So size of the group, it's important to know that groups can be various sizes, right? Groups just means more than one person. Um, however, the smaller the group, the more intimate it's going to be, right? Because people are probably going to feel more comfortable sharing, more comfortable connecting. And also, um, it's going to be more easy to notice if a member is absent in a small group. So if it's a group of six and someone's absent, that's going to be pretty noticeable. If it's a larger group, say 25, it's probably not going to be as intimate. People are probably not going to share on the same level they would in a smaller group. And if someone misses, it's probably not going to be as noticeable, right? So um, size of the group, it's also important to note if you are running and facilitating a group, you got to think of absences. You got to think of people dropping out of the group. So important all to note that the number you start with um, probably is not going to be the number of people you end with. So be thinking of that as well. Um, smaller groups are really good for accountability because they members feel a strong connection. So if a group member is absent, like we said, that will be more noticeable. And that person um, might the next week when they come back, they say, well, really, we really missed you. Um, tell us about what happened in the past week. So um, small groups are really good to build that connection. And it really is a community and a cohesive unit that works together. There's open groups, and these are groups that members can join and come in and out at any time. So the, the group might run for a set amount of time, a set amount of weeks, but a member could join at week one or a member could join at week seven. Um, so you might have fluctuating numbers. This has a variety of different challenges, right, if there's different people entering the group at different times. 
So open groups is one type of group. And then there's closed groups. These are ones in which members begin at a certain point. So you can either enter at week one or you can enter at week eight and that's it. That is just an example, of course. Um, during in closed groups, there's very little fluctuation of who's entering the group. So these are going to be probably more of those groups that have a tighter bond, um, stronger community and stronger participation. And usually in closed groups, members cannot join mid cycle. So um, there's usually like absence policies for closed groups. And once you are in, you're in, you cannot join mid cycle. Some things to know about facilitating groups, whenever there's an issue in gr groups. So say a client comes to you and says, I'm really feeling like I'm having a hard time managing my emotions. This is of course just an example. If a client comes to you and has an issue, you should encourage them to bring this issue back to the group. And why? Because that's going to be a really powerful therapeutic tool. What they're feeling is most likely what someone else in the group is feeling too. And that's a great talking point. It's a great tool to get the group talking, to get the, the group to kind of brainstorm and give advice. So in most cases, you're going to want to bring up any issues, concerns, or anything back to the group so that they can share their feelings. They can work out these things within the group setting. This is going to allow for support, it's going to be therapeutic, and it's going to build that community. So in most cases, if a client comes to you and wants to talk about something, encourage them to bring it back to the group, and the group can approach this issue. It's important to know when facilitating a group also, the social worker should kind of take a step back right? The, the purpose of a group is that group members are really working together, um, bouncing ideas off of one another, using the group as a therapeutic tool. So sometimes in the group, we're more of the facilitator. We're there to keep, make sure the ground rules are um, upheld, make sure that every, the, the clients in the group are safe. But a lot of the work in the group is done by the group members themselves. However, of course, there's an exception to the rule always, and there are a few instances when you're working in a group when you would not encourage the client to bring something to the group, or you would need to pull that client out of the group individually and have a conversation. So like I said, in most cases, you'd bring something back to the group. Like we said, I'm having trouble managing my emotions. I'm having trouble with my anger. Bring that back to the group. However, there's some instances when you would need to meet privately with a group member. When this is, if the member discloses abuse or neglect of a minor, if you know as a mandated reporter you're going to have to report and you or you need to collect more information outside of the group setting, you would pull that group member aside and discuss it. If a group member makes suicidal or homicidal comments that require further their safety assessment, you need to follow up on that, right? You need to assess for risk. So you would pull the group member out there and do your safety assessment. If the member is abusing substances as in, and is in need of an immediate referral, obviously you don't need to address that in front of the entire group. Um, you would pull them aside, give them the support that they need. When you wouldn't bring something back to the group, if it's going to harm the group dynamic in any way, or if you think that it could cause a safety risk or um, some sort of threat to the group as well. So, for example, say a client, you see that they're making some statements that may lead you to think that a further risk assessment is needed. You're going to want to, after group, pull them aside and see what's going on. Some other things to note when running groups. Um, important that group members follow the ground rules. You can remind the members of the ground rules. And if it is causing such a disruption to the group that it's the group members are feeling unsafe um, or it's just not conducive to the group at that time, you can remove someone from the group. So that is also, um, there are cases where a group member might need to be removed if it's not con conducive to helping the group move, move forward or it's a safety issue. Confidentiality. We have to do our best to uphold and respect confidentiality. As the facilitator in a group, it's important that group members know what to expect. 
and that confidentiality is very clear and talked about. So that's probably one of the biggest rules in group therapy is that what happens in group stays in group. So it's important that group members are not sharing personal information about other group members outside of the group setting. Um, you, you obviously talk about this. And then also if confidentiality is breached, if a member does go outside of the group and share confidential information, it's important that that is not only brought up in group, but it's processed in the group and discussed and how you're going to move forward. It's very important that the group knows if confidentiality is broken and how to move forward with that. It's going to be on a case by case basis, um, depending on, you know, what that meant when confidentiality was broken. But as a facilitator, important to um, stress the importance of confidentiality and to make sure that group members understand what that means. Obviously very difficult because you're bringing together more people than you just would in a one-to-one -one setting. There's two phenomenons that happen in groups. There's group think and group polarization. We'll talk about both. The first is group think. And what is group think? Group think is when a group comes together, so the group's working, and they make faulty or not very good decisions because there's group pressures that might be to conform to the group or to maintain harmony in the group or to avoid conflict. So I'm going to make a decision. The group's going to make a decision because everyone else is doing this and I don't want to rock the boat. So I'm not going to, to make my opinion known. Um, groups that have this group think phenomenon often ignore alternative opinions and don't take into account the consequences of these decisions. So oftentimes they're making a decision and not seeing it in the, the larger scheme of what might happen if they make this decision. When does group think happen? It often happens in groups where there's little diversity. So many people already have the same opinion. Um, groups that have a lot of the same makeup, either in race or age, gender, socioeconomic status, um, or groups where there's very little discussion of opposing opinions. So groupthink is kind of when we come to this group decision and I want to maintain conformity, we want cohesion in this group, although we're not seeing what the consequence of these decisions might have. An example of groupthink is the Challenger space shuttle um, incident. So what, what happened with this was there were engineers working on the space shuttle, and some engineers were aware that some of the parts on the space shuttle were faulty um, and that they should not be put out. However, they didn't want to rock the boat. They didn't want negative press. They wanted to go forward with this launch. There was probably a lot of other internal pressures from within. So they did not speak up about these faulty parts and they went forward with the space launch regardless. So that's an example of group thing, kind of going forward with an opinion, um, going forward with a plan. Although you might know that there's, you know, you're not taking into account the, the larger consequences that these decisions would have. And then there's group polarization. Group polarization is basically when there is dominant points of view in the group and group members that didn't have this strong of opinion start to slowly sway into that more extreme position. So um, oftentimes with group polarization, Group members that would have had maybe one opinion on their own start to become more extreme in their own views over time because they're going towards that dominant point of view. So it's kind of this shifting from maybe middle of the road opinions to more extreme on either end. An example of group polarization is a mob mentality. So what a mob mentality is, is when people follow the actions and behaviors of their peers. So if you're in a large group of people and then some maybe violent or aggressive acts happen and more and more people are joining in um, and this behavior is much more violent and aggressive than they ever would have acted individually or in isolation. So you see this happen, you know, frequently, um, kind of the energy of the crowd, more and more people are starting to join in. However, in isolation, they would not have made that choice. So group polarization is moving more towards some of these extreme behaviors, extreme thinking, extreme actions. 
So let's end with a practice question. I will go ahead and read it, read the answer choices, and then we will go through process of elimination. When working as a facilitator in a group setting, which of the following is true of confidentiality? A, confidentiality is guaranteed as it is required of all group members. B, confidentiality will be upheld as much as possible, but given the nature of groups, it cannot be guaranteed. C, group members must be excused from the group if confidentiality is breached. D, confidentiality depends on the type of group and purpose of the group. Go ahead and read that. Remember, you always want to try to use process of elimination. And here we're looking for the true answer or the correct answer. So we know we can do process of elimination based on answers that are not true. So what I would do is I'd start eliminating. What do we know is not true? What can we rule out? A, confidentiality is guaranteed as it is required of all group members. In a perfect world, that would be the case. However, we as the facilitator can never guarantee the actions of others. It's encouraged, but it cannot be guaranteed. So A would be ruled out. We have three more answer choices. Answer C, group members must be excused from the group if confidentiality is breached. That may be true, but it's not true in all cases, right? In some cases, if confidentiality is, is breached, the group member may stay in the group. So we can't make that blanket statement that that's always the case. So A is eliminated and C is eliminated. We're now down to answer choices B or D. What else can we eliminate? Which one is not true? D, confidentiality depends on the type of group and the purpose of the group. Confidentiality in a therapeutic setting should always be protected. It doesn't matter the type of group or the purpose. Um, in a therapeutic setting, just like in an individual setting, group members are protected, right? That is gone over when they sign consent, and we are going over this with the client. So D is out, which leads us to process of elimination. The correct answer is B. Confidentiality will be upheld as much as possible, but given the nature of groups, it cannot be guaranteed. So of course, as the facilitator, we're going to encourage it as much as possible. However, we cannot guarantee it based on our inability to control if other members are upholding confidentiality or not. So B is the correct answer. This does not go over everything you need to know with group work, but hopefully it touched on some major points and some things to consider as you're seeing questions on the exam that pertain to groups. If you are interested in more of my content, I encourage you to check out my website, topsocialworktestprep.com. My new platform has tons and tons of mini lessons. It's great for audiovisual learners. It includes two free study groups a month. So I encourage you to check that out. You can do a free preview as well. If you have any questions, my email is there. I want to thank you for tuning in today. I hope you picked up some important points when working with groups. And um, wherever you are in your studying journey, remember that you got this. And Trust in yourself and trust in your ability to be the best social worker you can be. Thank you for tuning in.